Perth Linux Users Group, talking Linux and open source. Yes, and we're recording. OK, fantastic, yeah, wonderful. So lots and lots of people mentioned Linux um, before with like introductions and everything. This has nothing to do with Linux, um, except some technologies might use Linux, but I don't mention it specifically. So um, when I grew up as a child, um, I spent a lot of time watching spy movies. And what I loved about all of these spy movies were the gadgets. The gadgets were my favorite thing. Everything else I didn't really care for, but I wanted to see the gadgets. And so you had things like a cigarette that was also a rocket launcher. Or there would be a car that would also be a submarine. Or this is my favorite. It was a watch which, had, which doubled as a cool label maker. <laughs> and growing up, this is what I wanted most of all because I loved label makers. But there was one thing that didn't really sit very well with me. And um, that was this. It was a car that knew where it was. And I'm like, well, that's not very realistic. How would a car know where it is and know what the streets around it look like? That's impossible. That would never happen in my lifetime. And um, what we've discovered is that the future arrives very, very quickly. Obviously, cars do know where they are now. In fact, I have these little mobile computers which know exactly where I am. And uh, the future arrives much more quickly than we expect. So um, that's actually a problem. If I want to talk to people um, about things like in vitro meat, uh, which is grown in a lab rather than a farm, if I want to talk to people about 3D printed body parts, for example, um, if I want to talk to people about what it might be like for a machine to fully experience what it's like to go to Burning Man, I get told that's unrealistic. I get told that will never happen in my lifetime, even though everything I've shown you there is already true, already exists. Now, one of the reasons for this is quite straightforward. A lot of emerging technologies are really quite scary, and people feel very uncomfortable thinking about them. And when they feel uncomfortable thinking about them, it feels much safer to say, well, that's impossible. That can't happen. But the result is that we go from impossible to already happened, and there's an app for it, without us talking about really the ethics or the consequences in between. And this is not something we should be doing. We should be identifying future technologies and talking about them before they mature. So I'm going to teach you one weird trick on how you can talk to other people about new technologies. And that is rather than say, hey, we're going to have uh, 3D printed body parts a couple of years ago or in a couple of years' time, instead say, think forward into the future. Think forward 1,000 uh, years or think forward 10,000 years. And now just imagine how much progress we might see. And it helps to give them a reference point. Say, think about 20 years ago and what technology was like then versus what it is now. Then think forward 10,000 years. And think about a future where we might have uh, children uh, 3D printing prosthetics as a camp activity. Um, think about a world where in vitro meat may have come down dramatically in price and actually be affordable. Uh, think about a world where people have advanced 3D virtual reality systems in their lounge room. <laughs> and what people do is when you frame this in terms of 1,000 years in the future or 10,000 years in the future, People go, oh, this is a thought experiment. I'm not talking about present day technologies. I'm absolutely not making a decision. And I'm definitely not talking about anything which already exists. And what you find is that people then don't feel threatened by these ideas. And you can have a reasonable conversation. You can actually talk about, hey, what would be good? What would be bad? What are some of the risks involved? So I want all of you to think forward 10,000 years into the future when we might have autonomous vehicles. So these are cars, obviously far in the future, which are able to drive themselves. They don't require a human. They're able to do it all by themselves. And I want to propose to you a thought experiment. So imagine that you are in an autonomous vehicle. You're not driving it. You're just a passenger because they no longer have drivers. And it's going along a cliff face, this 
little cliff face, this little road, it's single lane, it's been carved out of the cliff, there is a sheer drop on one side. And whilst you're in here, um, playing Candy Crush on your phone or whatever you're going to be doing whilst you're in your autonomous vehicle, there's a child that runs out into the middle of the road chasing a ball and trips. Don't worry about where they come from, it's a thought experiment. The gotcha is that your car cannot stop in time to avoid hitting that child with what will almost certainly be a fatal collision. But the car that you're in does have an option. It can throw itself off the cliff. And the question is, should it? Should the car sacrifice itself and its passenger in order to save that child? What happens if there's two children? What happens if there's five children? What if the car is also a submarine? These are things that I want you to think about. And at some point, I hope that you'd say, yes, the car should throw itself off the cliff if there's one person inside and there's five children in front of it. At some point, I want that, ch that car to throw itself off the cliff. And if you're wondering, how does it know? It's the future. The car knows. And this brings us into the fascinating realm of machine ethics, actually looking at the ethics of machines. When they have to make decisions, who should die? How do those decisions get made? What would the result of that be? Now, just a, a, a voluntary show of hands here. Um, who in this room would purchase a car that you know would potentially kill you if it meant saving more human lives? So some, some hands went up. All of you people who put up your hands, if that's a genuine hand putting up, you people are amazing and I love you. <laughs> and that is fantastic. But a lot of people didn't put up hands. Now, I said this is only if you're comfortable. So maybe you were thinking internally, yeah, I'd buy one of those cars. Um, but really, some people might not. And that brings us up to a really interesting question. Is there a market for unethical autonomous vehicles? Is there a market for cars which will say, hey, you know what, if you buy this car, it's never going to kill you. It'll run down a thousand other people before it kills you. <laughs> I don't want that to exist in the world. That is not going to make the future a better place. And in fact, you can end up with all of these terrible situations where all of the cars are being you know, horribly unethical in, in how they actually work. But there's a more interesting question for this. I actually think a much, much more interesting question. So imagine back to that cliff face. And imagine that you've got uh, your vehicle, which is driving along. Imagine there's more than one passenger in that vehicle. And the child runs out into the middle of the road. Now, let's say the, ch the car can stop itself safely. And nobody will be injured. But it also has the option of running over the child. <laughs> the question I have for you, how many people need to be inconvenienced before you can justify running over that child. Now, I hope that you feel that this is a horrifying question. And it is a horrifying question, because if you have a, a vehicle which can safely stop, surely it is better for it to do so than to actually kill a human, because otherwise it might inconvenience people. But this is actually one of the questions we have an answer to. At the moment, at least using the United States figures, for every 8 million trips, for every 8 million people we convenience, a person dies in a traffic fatality. So we consider it to be at least tolerable for one person to die for every 8 million people who are inconvenienced. Now, I hope that autonomous vehicles can do better than that. Um, and obviously, the rate of injuries is much, much higher. But this is a benchmark which we already have. So if we have uh, more than 8 million people convenienced per death, that's a good thing. The one thing that we can't say is that nobody should die. The moment you say with autonomous vehicles that nobody should die because of an autonomous vehicle, what it does is it drives at five kilometers an hour because maybe a child will run out chasing a ball that it didn't see. And then it might have to hit the child. So the moment you say nobody should die, they become unusable. So you do need to have figures in here. You need to have some sort of balance. Because autonomous vehicles are much safer than humans, it can be much, much better than what we have now, but we still need to make that decision. The other thing which is interesting, um, at the moment we have about 40,000 fatalities each year in the United States due to traffic accidents. And um, you could imagine if we had uh, autonomous vehicles that that might go down to, to virtually nothing because they have 
uh, uh, no problems with fatigue. They don't check their phones uh, whilst they're driving. Um, they're not like looking out the window at the scenery. You know, autonomous vehicles are much, much safer. But then imagine that you have a software bug that in one day kills 2,000 people. Now, this is much, much fewer people, many, many fewer people than what we have before, but it's 2,000 people which are the responsibility of one bug and of one company. And what you end up with is an enormous concentration of liability. Now, this means that if you are a manufacturer of autonomous vehicles, they don't just need to be safer than humans, they need to be orders of magnitude safer than humans, because otherwise you are going to get headlines saying, you know, killer cars, you know, terrorizing our roads, so on and so forth. It also means that this is a real limitation to entering the market. Because if you can kill 2,000 people in a day due to a software bug, that is terrifying to your bottom line. You can imagine what you might see, particularly in America, which is a very litigious uh, 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 country, you can imagine what would happen if everybody you know, decides to sue. So the question is, how do we actually get around this? And um, there's all sorts of interesting things. You can have uh, legislative change. Um, I'm very, very much in favor of whenever you sell an autonomous vehicle or whenever you register an autonomous vehicle, you have money from that go into a pool. And then if you happen to have an accident that involves that vehicle, which is not involving negligence, it is an honest to goodness mistake that has occurred, um, then yes, you have compensation paid out, but it's paid out of that pool. And you see that with a lot of uh, traffic accident commissions. Uh, you actually see that with vaccinations as well. There's a vaccinations court uh, in the United States where people do have adverse reactions to vaccinations, but you have a level of shielding to the vaccination manufacturers. You might also see differences there uh, with insurance changes. Um, maybe the insurance companies are like going to say, hey, autonomous vehicles are so much safer that will give you such you know, large premiums that, yeah, if something goes wrong as an insurance company, we'll cover that. But what I think we're most likely to see is instead of autonomous vehicles being owned privately, I think the majority of them will see corporate ownership, vast amounts of corporate ownership, which in some ways allows a company to take that risk um, that there might be problems. And we've seen this uh, in a lot of movies. Uh, we've seen uh, Johnny Cab uh, in old uh, Schwarzenegger films and everything. Um, but I think we're likely to see a robo-Uber. And when I say I think we're likely to see a robo-Uber, I really mean it, because the Uber CEO has said, hey, please give me half a million autonomous electrical ve electric vehicles as soon as they become available. And this makes perfect sense. Electric vehicles are cheap to run. You can keep them on the roads if they're robotic the entire time. The biggest cost to your drivers, here you're eliminating the humans. It makes perfect economic sense to do that. In the United States, there's 230,000 taxi drivers. So that's a lot of people who would be out of a job. All of your existing Uber drivers, all of your existing taxi drivers, they're likely to lose their, their jobs when we start seeing autonomous vehicles. But that is an absolute drop in the ocean compared to the 3.5 million truck drivers that exist in the United States. That is an awful lot of people. And it's not just the truck drivers who are at risk, it's all of the people who support them as well. Uh, it is your little gas stations, it is your motels, it's your entertainment, it's your truck stops. It's all of these places that exist between these cities that pretty much have the economies run by truckers, that depend upon truckers. So what we're likely to see with autonomous vehicles is a large level of technological unemployment. Because these are jobs which will disappear. Yes, you might see new jobs in terms of building these and programming them, but I doubt that you'll see as many as the number of truck drivers that are put out of work. Now, this is not new. This is not something that is new to society. Um, this has happened before. The Industrial Revolution is the most uh, beautiful example of this, uh, where you had a lot of jobs which were done by humans that got converted to being done by machines. And um, in fact, there was a lot of uh, fear that these machines would take people's jobs entirely, to the point um, that in England, in 1812, there was a law that was enacted that made it a capital offence to harm a robot or, through an action, allow a robot to come to harm. <laughs> this is a real law. It was the Destruction of Stocking Frames Act, 1812. 
And the reason was because you had predominantly tailors and people who were working uh, with fabrics who said, hey, these machines are going to take our jobs. I'm going to be completely obsolete. And you have examples of tailors breaking into factories and burning them to the ground. Now, as we know, we still have tailors. And in fact, they're a lot more efficient because we now have sewing machines. But there's a lot of jobs we no longer have. We no longer have water bearers. Water bearers used to exist, and they would bring water to your home. They would fill up cisterns in your home. You would pay the money for this. We don't have them anymore because we have plumbing. And in fact, one of my main jobs is automation engineering. I replace people with very small, instead of shell scripts, it's usually Perl scripts. But I've had times where I've gone to workplaces, and I'm like, oh, this thing that you're, like, it's been your entire job for 10 years. Yeah, in an hour, I just completely automated your job. And um, that's kind of scary when we start to see more and more of this. And it's not just low-level jobs which are being replaced. We're seeing more and more mid-level jobs being replaced as well. So how do we avoid uh, the demons of uh, technological unemployment? Well, one thing is absolutely uh, to provide access to education. If you have somebody who is out of work for whatever reason and they have easy access to education, they can reskill. If you have new jobs being created, education allows people to enter those jobs. And affordable education is going to be absolutely key if we're going to mitigate this in any way at all. Now, some of you might also say, well, Industrial Revolution, we didn't lose jobs then, but that's not actually the case. If you look at hours worked, we are working many fewer hours compared to before the Industrial Revolution. And in fact, if you go back to 1830, the average Western work week was about 70 hours. Um, in 1988, it got down to about 40 hours. And what's interesting is it stabilized around 40 hours. For, for various factors, there's a real resistance below, going below 40 hours for a, a full-time work week. At the same time, there's a lot more leisure. People have much, much more leisure in their life, not just because they're working less, um, but also because their lifetimes are longer. So the average uh, number of leisure hours per lifetime has gone up from about 43,000 to about 122,000 in that same time frame. And uh, this is because humans are living longer and they're working le less. So what I'm really curious about, in 10,000 years' time, when we have all of these uh, smart robots and everything, what will people do with their time? What are people going to do with all of this leisure time? Well, you already know the answer of that, uh, because for absolutely centuries, uh, people have used it to draw pictures of cats or share pictures of cats. Um, I'm very much into calligraphy, and I have a great love of finding illuminated manuscripts which have pictures of cats in the borders. And there are entire websites devoted to this sort of thing. But the other thing which you find when people are given more time is they have an increase in innovation. They have more time to try out new ideas. They have more time to be artistic. They have more time to think. So maybe in 10,000 years, and this is what I, the future I want to see, maybe in 10,000 years, humans may not have to work. We may have a situation uh, where robots do the vast majority of the work for us, and we have some beautiful robots which we've pictured here. Um, but I think one of the things we need to address is how do we deal with, if we're still in a capitalist society, how do we deal with money at that point? And I think that providing a basic income, a guaranteed minimum livable income, regardless of whether or not you're working, is absolutely essential to do that. Because otherwise you'll have humans competing for more and more jobs, which simply don't exist. With the vision of the future, I think this is pretty fantastic, although I do sincerely hope that we have better names for our robots. This one here is called Made Without Tears, which is kind of terrifying what that implies what, to the author, uh, the author of this, um, in terms of how they treat their maids, their human maids. Um, so I would like better named robots than Maids Without Tears. Other interesting things which we might see in this far distant future of robots um, are these things. People keep talking about these. Obviously, they don't exist yet. This is a far future idea. Um, these are little drones. They're little things which are able to fly around and do stuff. And um, they have enormous potential for good. Absolute enormous potential for good. Um, for very, very basic things, um, such as deliveries, 
um, getting something to your door. A drone can come and drop it off and everything. If you have an area which is inaccessible by road, these are fantastic for being able to deliver things. And most importantly, when it comes to disaster relief. You can get these to inaccessible areas. They can deliver food. They can deliver medicine. They can potentially go looking for survivors. That's absolutely what we want. Um, these have also been proposed for uh, sort of much more whimsical things. Some of you might remember uh, Taco Copter, uh, which was a, a, it was a fake app. Um, and what you could do is you could say, I want to have some tacos delivered to me. And it's, it says, great, I know your GPS location. I'll send a drone there and they'll drop you off. Um, so Taco Copter, as far as I know, has not been built. However, there is the Burrito Bomber, which has been built. And the Burrito Bomber is here being loaded up with a burrito, which is attached to a parachute. And sure enough, you put in your location and it flies over and it drops the burrito down for you to enjoy. These are all good things. These are all great for humanity. Things which these can do which are not great for humanity. Weapons. Killing people. Um, you may have seen this. This is a, a Predator drone. And um, they have absolutely taken off, no pun intended there, um, but they've taken off in a number of war zones around the world because it means you don't have a human who is directly uh, being threatened. And um, these can fly around. They can do surveillance, but they can also kill people as well. One of the most important aspects of these drones at the moment, for every killer drone at the moment, is that in a kill decision, a human must be involved. So these can autonomously fly themselves, they can make t they, uh, identify targets, they can relay that back to home to say, hey, I have found the target, but you still need a human to press the button and say, yes, go through with this. And uh, the consequence of this is that they're susceptible to something. They're susceptible to jamming. If you are able to stop this from saying, hey, I've got this target, or you're able to stop it from receiving the signal saying, yes, you have a green light to do a kill, then they don't cause any harm, or they're not going to kill anyone. And so now you have a number of war zones where as soon as the drone is seen, you pull out your jamming rig and you point it at the drone, and it can't hurt you anymore. And in fact, there have been some interesting cases, and the, the background behind it is uh, somewhat hard to track, of these actually being convinced to land in enemy territories where they can then be disassembled and reverse engineered. So, because uh, that happened in Iraq a few years ago, it was very, very interesting. Um, the, the Iraqi government said, um, sorry, not Iraq, in Iran, um, the Ara Iranian government said, yes, we've managed to capture this drone. Uh, we did a GPF spoofing attack on it to convince it that this was its home field, and we jammed all the other communications, and it said, hey, I'm just going to land now. Whether or not that's actually the case, I don't know, but they definitely got a drone, and um, they've been pulling it apart. So. What's the obvious way of combating this if you are a military power? It's to make lethal autonomous robots, to have things that no longer have a human in the loop to make that kill decision. Because it's very much a courtesy to the human to let them do that. The robot really doesn't need it. Um, it's simply removing a couple of lines of code that check to see if that uh, kill decision has been made. The advantages from a military standpoint of these, they can't be jammed because they're no longer uh, talking back to a human operator, uh, so these can be completely autonomous. You can also make them very stealthy. They no longer require any sort of radio emissions because they don't need to talk back to home. So potentially you could launch one of these on a mission and uh, be far away from wherever you launched it by the time it finds its target and, uh, and makes that attack. This gets a little bit more frightening as well when you start looking at these. Um, so this here is a solar-powered drone uh, made by a company called Zephyr. And um, it was able to stay in the air for two continuous weeks. And the reason they brought it down was not because it couldn't run after two weeks, but because, and this is a direct quote, had nothing to prove by having it stay in the air any longer. So these essentially have an unlimited time in the air because they're solar powered. They also fly very, very high, 21 kilometers up. So very, very high up, which makes them hard to spot because they're so high up in the air. Now, something which is able to fly very high, which has unlimited running time and therefore has unlimited range, 
Something like this you can launch in one part of the earth and you can then have it take, possibly take months, but find itself in another part of the earth. That is fantastic for things like environmental monitoring because it's fantastic to have something watching the oceans continuously for 24 hours a day. That would be wonderful. But if you have something which has unlimited range that can fly anywhere in the world and you combine that with a weapon system which is able to make its own kill decisions, that is absolutely terrifying. And you kind of know where that ends up. That's a drone from Terminator for those of you uh, who have watched the Terminator series. What's even more terrifying about this, at least in my mind, is this idea of, autonom of, of on anonymous warfare that you may have actors, including non-state actors, anywhere in the world that may be able to launch um, relatively low payload drones, but ones which may, uh, may be able to fly a great distance before attacking a target. And that would absolutely change the state of warfare, and I think in a disastrous way, because it means that you no longer see accountability of who is launching these. And we're seeing more and more off-the-shelf components, we're seeing more reverse-engineered machines. And in fact, the uh, Human Rights Watch uh, gave a report to the United Nations saying that this is an absolutely critical area which needs to be addressed now. That we should not ever be building autonomous killer robots that would be disastrous for humanity. And I absolutely agree with them. However, there can also be things which are disastrous for humanity, uh, certainly in our 10,000-year future, which don't have to do with weapons. And um, I want to talk uh, about different forms of machine intelligence here. So some of you uh, may remember Watson. Does anyone remember Watson? The Excellent. Watson was a machine uh, by IBM that won Jeopardy uh, back in 2011. And it's very, very cool because Jeopardy involves uh, processing uh, natural language. It involves uh, beating other humans to the buzzer. That was actually the easy part because it had really great reaction times. Parsing questions, looking up knowledge. It was a really, really smart machine. Winning Jeopardy is something which is hard for a machine to do. Now, since 2011, Watson has not been you know, dismantled and thrown away and everything. Uh, the Watson technology has been reused to absorb pretty much as much medical knowledge as possible. And um, so Watson is now very, very good at diagnosis. And uh, this is brilliant for uh, Sherlock fan fiction writers everywhere <laughs> because we now have Dr. Watson. <laughs> and um, what you find is that Dr. Watson is, and this is fantastic, better than human doctors at cancer diagnoses, particularly some types of cancer. So now you have a machine which can spot cancer earlier than human doctors can spot cancer. And this is absolutely what you want, because the earlier you spot cancer, the better your, your outlook is. And this can potentially be used for a whole bunch of other diseases as well. So you can imagine the advantage of every time you take a blood test, every time you have a medical test, you have these uh, robot doctors that are looking over the results and saying, hey, I think there's something up here, getting much, much earlier diagnosis of disease. This would be fantastic. We also have Watson uh, advising uh, treatment plans. And uh, Watson is being used for this right now. And 90% uh, of the time, when Watson suggests a treatment plan, it is followed exactly as Watson pre uh, presents it, with, with no uh, variations. So we have human doctors and human uh, medical people who are saying, yeah, Watson's doing a pretty good job here. So far, this sounds great, doesn't it? Absolutely great. And I was delighted by this. I'm like, this is exactly what I want to be seeing with medical technology, with artificial intelligence, until I discovered um, that one of Watson's employers is WellPoint. And WellPoint is a medical insurance agency in the United States, the largest medical insurance agency in the United States. And unfortunately, they have a history of targeting their case, uh, cancer patients for rescission. Now, that's the process where you say, oh, gosh, yes, you've got cancer. That's going to be very expensive to treat. But you said that you were going to die, like reveal all of your uh, previous illnesses and existing conditions when you filled out your medical form. And we discovered that you broke your ankle when you were six years old and you never told us about that. So actually, your, uh, your entire policy is invalid. So this is something that was so bad, it received presidential attention that they were 
finding people who are too expensive to treat and finding essentially loopholes to drop them from their plants. Now, I cannot say whether or not uh, their use of Watson is being used for the most human good possible, but I certainly have doubts about that. I certainly feel that Watson could be used to make uh, humanity a worse place, to make the world a worse place, and uh, it may well be used for that at the moment. Now, everything which I've shown you in this talk, despite me saying think 10,000 years in the future, they have all been real technologies. Everything which I've shown you here exists today already. But I do want to encourage you to think about what they're going to be like in the future. And if you are developing a technology, I very, very much want you to think about what will that technology be like a thousand years or 10,000 years in the future. How will it be used? Uh, is that good or bad? And if it's not going to be used for the most good, how can you change things so it will be? Do you change the technology? Do you change society? Do you educate people? What can you do to make sure that your technology and the technology of other people will do the most good? Because I guarantee you that the future will be awesome provided that we make it so. Everybody, thank you very much. So, are we doing questions? Mm-hmm. Many people talk of the convergence of IT and uh, genomics. So, what's your take on that? Um, it's a it's a field with uh, plenty of potential, slowing down the aging process. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't want to live uh, another thousand years mm -hmm. rather than build a robot? Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the field of genomics, uh, that's where my family went with the MIT. So, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a field which is very interesting because actually you can actually reverse engineers a, a lot of things mm -hmm. and you can uh, work on neural networks to slow down the aging process. So what's the feel about IT and the potential for very interesting job, which mm -hmm. are both the convergence of IT and the genome? So um, I have lots of opinions about this, so I'll try not to talk for too long about them. Um, I find, so, so first of all, the, the merging of, uh, I'll go beyond genomics to, to biotechnology in general. Um, so one thing that I find fascinating at the moment is there is a project called the Open Worm Project, and it is the, uh, uh, essentially the emulation of the entire neural structure of a very, very small nematode, uh, C. elegans. And um, it's got about a thousand cells in total. It has about, I think it's a hundred and something neurons. We are now able to uh, simulate an actual multicellular living organism, or at least its, its neural system. And, um, and that I find fascinating because it's the very, very first steps to uh, having digital life, which is representative of real life. And you can find that you can, you can put one of these uh, systems into a robot and the robot displays exactly what you expect in terms of uh, feeding behavior, in terms of avoiding noxious stimuli, um, all of those sorts of things. So I think one thing we need to think about is, sure, with a, with a little nematode, ethical considerations there are not too difficult. What happens when we start emulating bees? which is the next thing that's being worked on. What happens when we then start to uh, uh, look at emulating mammals? Uh, do we do a, a simulation of a mammalian brain? Because that we definitely can say can experience joy and pain and those sorts of things. Um, but when it comes down to uh, genomics, I find it fascinating because a lot of people have these really sort of um, gut reactions for like, oh, that, that doesn't feel right. And uh, one of my favorite examples is with in vitro meat. And in vitro meat is uh, grown uh, in a culture, and it's not actually modified at all. It's, um, uh, you've got uh, in vitro meat, which is taken, uh, stem cells directly taken from an animal, but a lot of people have this, oh, that doesn't feel right, even though there is a lot less um, um, pain involved. Um, the ethics, I, I feel, are clearly better because you have cruelty-free meat. And I think one of the things I would love to see I think we've got great potential for advances in genomics, particularly with the convergence of IT. I think one of the troubles there is getting people to think about this in a consistent way. 
because our gut ethics, our gut feelings are very, very different from the actual ethical considerations once you sit down and think about them. Um, I think that treating, uh, to give you an example, um, the moment you talk about treating aging and you have, you know, here is the possibility of people being able to live forever, people start bringing up this argument of, uh, of overpopulation. You know, what's going to happen with, with, uh, with overpopulation? And what you find is that um, more than half of the world's countries actually have a below fertility birth rate. And if you sit down and do the maths, that means that population will eventually stabilize. You'll actually have people who stop reproducing because, you know, everyone's having a, a couple has one child. So 100 people in one generation, you then have 50 people in the next generation. Each generation is smaller than the last and it trends towards zero. So I think that saying that overpopulation is going to be a problem is it's really a bogeyman. And I don't think that that's a, a, a valid argument, but it is one that comes from ignorance. Um, the other thing is that when people start talking about overpopulation, we know a lot of the ways to solve that. And it is predominantly education and empowerment of women um, that solves that. The moment that you educate and empower women, you find that the number of children that families have go down. Um, when you start finding uh, birth rates, uh, sorry, not birth rates, uh, infant mortality rates go down, uh, you find that dramatically drops family sizes as well. So I think the moment somebody says that population is a concern, I have a counter argument for them immediately about how we should be um, improving things, particularly for the poorest women in the world, um, which is very pleasing for me because it means that the solution for that is in line with my actual ethics. But I think that there's great potential to be had there. Um, and it's kind of frustrating that we're not moving as forward as, as, as much as I would like. But that's almost all of human progress is that we're not moving as forward quite as much as I would like. I don't know if that answers your question or not. Sorry? Yes, there, there potentially would be. Mm. But I absolutely feel that we should be treating um, aging the same way that we treat any other disease. Um, it's like, oh, you've, you, know, you have uh, cancer, you have liver disease, you have all of these other sorts of things. I feel that we should be treating aging the same way. And um, we have this weird idea that no is something which is it's natural. And so therefore... You know, it's okay that it happens. And I'm like, well, no, cancer is natural. And, you know, we don't treat that as it's okay. I, I would love that. I would love that. Yeah. Well, that's, that, that is actually one of the other things as well, um, is that people go, oh, no, we shouldn't, be, we shouldn't be treating aging as a disease. But what you find is that we essentially are in that we're treating heart disease, we're treating cancer, we're treating all of these other sorts of things, which are very much correlated with age. You don't find as many young people getting cancer as old people getting cancer. Um, so we are treating parts of aging, even if we're skirting around this idea of completely treating aging. But, uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see... I feel how we get over uh, a lot of the same stumbling blocks that we have with genetically modified foods, that we have with in vitro meat, uh, I feel that we'd see the same stumbling blocks there. And a, a very interesting historical example is with heart transplants. The very, very first heart transplants were considered to be abominations. And this was the most unnatural thing that could ever exist. And now we treat organ transplants as being something which does a lot of good. Yes. <laughs> It's, it's, yeah, a absolutely, and very often it's made from yourself as well, your own, own cells. Um, do we have any other questions? Over here? Um, so these autonomous cars that uh, make these ethically tricky decisions, Yes. Um, if we get laws about what they need to do, or yes. we want to check their diesel emission levels or something <laughs> like that. Make sure they're not made by Volkswagen. Maybe. Yes. <laughs> Is it better that we mandate that they're documented and open and fixable? Mm. Or maybe they should be welded shut so that no one can change them? Are we talking about the software or the hardware or everything? I guess Probably everything. Th there, 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 it's so a blurred line, everything from firmware to software. To oh, software. this is a great question. So I'm unsurprisingly very much in support of open source. And I think that having open source technologies is vital because that people can then inspect what is going on here. Um, and you have more chance that people will find bugs and, and so on and so forth. Um, one of the great advantages of autonomous vehicles is that you hope that they cooperate. The idea of having uh, a mesh 
uh, communication where each car can say, hey, um, you know, this is what's happening on the roads ahead. We've got, uh, you know, poor weather. We've got some sort of obstacle, those sorts of things. And you have uh, essentially the ability to pack cars closer at higher speeds. Um, I think if you have, and this is fascinating, because you then end up with prisoner's dilemmas. So you end up with a situation where it's like, well, maybe my car is going to tell the cars behind it that this road is terrible and they shouldn't be driving down it and everything. That might not actually advantage my car, but it may advantage another car that's coming behind me. And so you then end up with this idea of you can hack other people's cars to, to report wrong information to advantage your car. So you have prisoner dilemma botnets throughout all the vehicles. So all of that I think is fascinating. What terrifies me is the idea of a car being hacked at all. Because if you have um, an exploit in a car and you then have people going out and hacking that car and somebody then deciding that, hey, at this point, we're just going to have all those cars turn off their brakes or whatever, that is going to be quite disastrous. Um, but I think we've learned from security that having open systems makes them more secure. So... <laughs> which is going to be quite debatable, <laughs> yes. <laughs> so I, I think, I hope that long-term open systems make them more secure, although Heartbleed is also a perfect example there, where Heartbleed, the, the vulnerability is, was there for years and years and years, and nobody was looking at it. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's uh, I mean, some of that's been a problem with not enough people being put on the project. Oh, absolutely. Well, it was one guy, wasn't it? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I went and I, w I, I asked myself, like, how did this happen? And I went to look at the repository. It's like, oh, wow, yeah, there's like one big contributor. Um, and that clearly is an issue when it comes to critical software. Um, so I, my default position is I feel more open, but that is not a strongly researched position, um, which means that I am very liable to change that in light of new evidence. On that note, I should also point out um, there is everything I've mentioned in this talk, there are citations. Um, it does say tinyurl.com slash uh, devworld2015 because my citations are more or less the same as the last time I gave this talk, except that I've added a whole bunch more content. So, but all of those are available there as well. Question up the back. At the start of the talk, you were talking about ethical machines. And yes. About halfway through, you talk about autonomous killing machines. Yes. So... Clearly, I would say we don't care very much. It depends upon the person. It depends upon the group. Um, if you're a military group, then killing people is essentially your job, um, which is awful that that exists, but that exists. Um, if you are a car, then getting people from one place to another is essentially the job of the car. Um, I do find interesting ideas where um, um, there are all sorts of sort of terrible scenarios you can imagine where does the car choose to kill the person inside it or the person on the road? Well, it depends upon what their insurance is like um, because maybe it's going to be uh, more expensive to society if it does this versus that. So there's all sorts of interesting things there. But I feel that as humans, we do care. I feel that our gut ethics are naturally flawed. And I can give you many, many examples of that. Um, but I feel that we do actually want to do the right thing. Now, what I find uh, maybe a little bit disappointing is that when we look at things like autonomous vehicles, I practically guarantee you that the speeds that they will travel at, all of those things we want to worry about, how many people will die per person inconvenience, those sorts of things, um, won't be actually thought about in a, you know, a strictly ethical sense. It'll be, well, what are the current uh, speed limits? And so it will be like, well, currently you can go 100 kilometers an hour down this road. So we'll say that robot cars can go 100 kilometers an hour down this road. And even though they're much, much, much safer, that 100, 100 kilometers an hour is essentially just the, we're going to keep doing this. We've found this thing and we're going to stick with it. Um, even though you might be able to run them at 200 kilometers an hour and be sa twice as safe. So I don't think that a lot of our ethical decisions will be based upon actual evidence. I think they'll be based upon historical laws that we have adapted because it will be easy for humans to accept that. And um, I don't think that that's optimal, but I don't feel it's, it's terrible either. I feel that getting autonomous vehicles would be very good. Does that answer your question?
No, it doesn't. Okay, good. Any other questions I can not answer? <laughs> yeah, you won't be able to get this one. <laughs> um, a lot of the examples you've given, like the drone strikes and the um, car fatalities, have a pretty obvious logical connection between um, what the tech is doing and the consequences when yes. you're talking about ethics. And given we've just had the discussion about um, ageing and mm -hmm. the expansion of tech to treat ageing and potentially indefinitely um, mm -hmm. when you look at where things are going, you have ethical things that, at least in the public de debate, are very much separated into nice compartments. And I yes. think the best example of that is going, uh, people may disagree, but personally I feel that if you're looking at massively extended human lives, mm -hmm. that existing without a right to die framework is absolutely horrifying. Oh, absolutely. And, but that debate is so much harder to connect. Like, how do you actually bring that out in public policy? So you can't answer that, oh. obviously. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, wish, I wish I had a solution <laughs> for that. Um, the very, very best thing I've be a been able to do, and this is why I mentioned the 10,000 year trick, is the 10,000 year trick. Because as soon as people start thinking about Star Trek, they go, oh, yeah, like how, how would we do this in the future? What would an ideal future look like? And it's easy to say, think about 10,000 years in the future when people are immortal, shouldn't they have some right to die? And it's much easier to get people to agree on that, and then once they've thought about it in the future, then, then bring it back. Um, and if you, otherwise, I find that people have knee-jerk reactions, which is not what you want. Right company uh, want to keep you alive rather than give you a cure. Yes. Sorry. On the uh, autonomous car thing, you were saying about um, car making a choice between killing the uh, pedestrian or killing the, the owner. Yes. What if the car has a tweakable options and <laughs> you can make that decision? Should I mean, how would society handle liability in these I cases? Will, so, so I actually feel that having tweakable options there is a terrible idea. Um, yeah. I feel that there should be... Um, um, has anyone here played Sid Meier's Alpha Centauri? Yeah, um, yeah so, so one of the technologies you research in that is ethical calculus, which allows you to determine which option is better. And it's like, oh, well, that's handy. Um, but I feel that having a tweakable option there is a terrible idea. Um, I feel that one option is going to be clearly better than the other. Um, but it is one of the reasons why I feel that private ownership of autonomous vehicles may not actually be the best thing. Um, because then the person who's in the car is very much invested with that car's decision and may choose a car based upon if it's an ethical or unethical car. Whereas if you have um, uh, fleets of cars which are either corporate owned or government owned or, or not privately held, then great, you're getting a car and you get the ethics that come with that car's programming. Um, Uber you know, may want to minimize their liability, for example, um, but I feel that that detachment is, is, in this case, a good thing. And it's actually my hope that we'll see a lot less privately owned vehicles when we see autonomous vehicles, because there's no need for you to privately own a car, except possibly as a status symbol, because you can just go, oh, I need a car to here. And rather than you having to walk to a car park, it just it turns up and it takes you there. Um, and I think rather than parking your car, we'll see more and more people say, hey, I can pay money for a car park or I can loan my car to the robo Uber equivalent and it will make money whilst I'm at work. So my actual hope is we'll see a lot less private car ownership. And there's some great models which people have done uh, based upon the amount that you're willing to pay. You might have a, a bus that turns up that picks you up that takes longer, but you pay a lower rate. And if you really need to get there quickly, then you know, your, your car arrives immediately um, and so on and so forth. Um, but I don't think tweakable options are a good idea. And so, yeah, there's some questions as to how do we stop there being tweakable options, if, especially if we have open frameworks. Yes? Um, you're talking about um, autonomous cars. Mm -hmm. We already have autonomous uh, uh, railway cars. Yes. Are we building the wrong technology? What's the driver there, you know, to build the correct technology? Are we building the wrong technology in that should we be building more trains yes. versus cars? So I really like trains. Um, that's probably not very surprising. Um, but I feel that because we have existing road infrastructure, um, I feel that because there is enormous convenience in having autonomous vehicles. Right now we see uh, a lot of pollution because you have people getting in their cars and driving to work. Um, and you have a lot of wastage because we're building all these cars for people to own that spend 90% of their time sitting in a car park or sitting by the side of the road. 
So I think autonomous vehicles are actually the right way to go in terms of getting rid of non-autonomous vehicles, which are such an enormous problem right now. And um, in fact, this is, uh, it's not lost on me that when uh, cars came out, they got rid of all the horses. And horses were terrible because they pooed everywhere. And you look at these old pictures of like New York City, and there would be this city block where they'd shovel horse poo, and it would be like this high. And it's like that was terrible for disease, for smell, for everything. So cars are bad in terms of carbon footprint, um, but they solved a lot of health issues associated with horses. And I feel that autonomous vehicles would solve a lot of the issues we see with non-autonomous vehicles um, and would have a lower carbon footprint overall once we start seeing these things. Uh, yes, uh, please. Isn't the argument about existing infrastructure the same argument for fibre to the node versus fibre oh, to the node? Oh, well <laughs> done. <laughs> well done. Can, can I <laughs> yes, marry up like, two of the ideas you had there, which was autonomous vehicles and drones? Um, mm -hmm. So people carrying drones. Flying cars! Well, y yes, I want maybe flying not cars. So, but don't call it a car, because that's an old technology. <laughs> but actually something that could be small enough that could carry one or two people in the same model means that that would then remove the, almost jetpack, remove the, the road network from being the constraint and in fact remove two dimensions from being the constraint oh, oh, in, ab in transport. Absolutely. So maybe Although that's a better technology to be looking at. Uh, that would be lovely. Um, I think getting that legislatively approved would be an absolute nightmare, whereas getting autonomous vehicles improved is something that we're going to be seeing now. So, um, and, and also, it's not a case of, oh, well, we can do this technology, but that stops us from doing that one. Um, I actually feel that we can see autonomous cars first, and then we can see flying cars come after that once people are like, oh, yeah, robots can drive us around, and that works really well. Um, and they'll also be more expensive. I imagine flying machines would be more expensive than, than road machines. Um, so in terms of accessibility and affordability, I think autonomous vehicles, autonomous cars, are going to be the first step. Mm. Um, but yes, I would love to see, I mean, planes are practically autonomous at the moment. Yeah. You have a passenger jet, it takes off, it, it lands, it has autopilot. Um, it kind of worries me personally that humans touch the controls of those sometimes, because I feel that humans probably aren't going to do as good a job. Um. Cars, road vehicles, are surprisingly expensive because of all the infrastructure we've had to build for them. Yes. And uh, square meterage on cities like this that sprawl. Oh, I know. Hunt, you know. And, and it's, it's one of the reasons I actually think that autonomous uh, cars will lower the requirements for that because you can drive them much, much closer together and they can efficiently take other routes as well. Um, I, I'm kind of sad whenever I see these enormous freeways because it's like, yeah, you've got this enormous freeway so humans can drive on them, but you still have the, the little choke points at the end. And if you then say, well, we'll get rid of the choke points at the end, then you in increase the number of people who drive cars. And you end up with these terrible cities where everybody is driving. Um, and that ends up just, you know, it doesn't relieve, relieve congestion. You just have more people on the roads, which is not what we want. Um, I think autonomous buses would be fantastic. Um, I think that seeing, to give you a great example with, uh, with trains, um, you have train infrastructure, and if I catch a taxi to my local train station, it might cost me 15 or 20 dollars. And I don't pay 15 or 20 dollars twice per day, that's really, really expensive. So, you know, maybe I drive to work instead. If I have an autonomous vehicle where there's no human driver involved, that can be much, much cheaper. It might be a couple of dollars. In which case, yeah, absolutely, I'm going to do that and hop on the train. Um, so I think that would actually see a lot more people using public transport because this gets you the last mile. And a lot of the time you have places with poor rail coverage, this lets you solve that problem. So I think that would be absolutely fantastic. Um, fingers crossed, we'll actually get there. Um, you opened with the autonomous car and horrible road in Peru equivalent of what is classically termed the trolley problem. Yes! And I'm surprised at no point you touched on the idea that why should the car not just act like a typical human? And the typical human response in that is to do nothing. Because no human, or most people, do not wish to actively choose the fate of the other person. Mm -hmm. So it makes a certain kind of sense to have these kind of autonomous vehicles act like people and make the same kind of ethical choices people would make to fit in society. Because they are going to be better. They're going to be faster. They're going to stop better. They're going to mm -hmm. have radar that sees through walls. Yep. Use the hypothetical example of a ball it doesn't see. 
but is a car that can't see a ball as a precursor to a child and stop faster and ahead necessarily the kind of vehicle that we should be allowing on the road? So that's, this is a wonderful question. If I address the question of shouldn't they act like humans, I actually feel that humans make terrible ethical choices. But yeah, one of one of my we hate the people who don't. One of my biggest problems with with humanity as a whole is that um, so if we're going to use uh, examples, Peter Singer has the drowning child, and um, to give you all a, a, a brief rundown, um, you're essentially uh, cycling to work, and there is a park with a, a shallow fountain in it, and there is an infant that is drowning, quite clearly drowning um, in the fountain. Um, that they might be like too far gone already. You're not sure, and the question is. Do you stop your, your bike ride into work and save the child? And you hope people say yes. And, um, and then you say, well, you don't have time to lock up your bike and your bike might get stolen. Are you still going to do this even if your bike gets stolen and the bike is worth like $2,000? And people go, yes. And you say, well, your bike's now been stolen, but you've saved this child. Did you make the wrong decision? And people go, no, 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 you, you need to save the child. And you say, well, what happens if you get there and it's too late? The child's already dead. And people go, well, I'm still glad that I tried. It's important that I tried. And of course, you then say, well, for $2,000, you can save the life of a child in a sub-Saharan African country. Um, you can prevent malaria. You can treat these diseases. You can provide humanitarian relief and everything. And suddenly people go, oh, well, that's different. And what we find is that if you've got something happening right in front of you, we act on that. And if it's happening to people far away, we don't. So I don't feel that human ethics are a good model to go by. Um, so I don't want to see a car which says, well, the human response would be to panic and not do anything and run through a, you know, a whole bunch of, of school children or whatever the situation might be. But my car isn't going to have to make the decision as to whether it's funding people in Africa. You know, that, that is the classical I would actually love it if it could, failure. but yes. <laughs> you know, it is, it is categorically the best example, and it's, it's so clear, you know. Mm. People make these decisions, yep. and it's written out every single day. It's why these people have to do TV ads to convince people to give $10. Yep. Because governments can't even make this decision collectively. Mm -hmm. It is the quintessential example of out of sight, out of mind. Absolutely. Climate change but, is another, yeah, another example one. there. But an active, in-the-moment ethical decision is generally pretty consistent mm. human to human and that's what we've broadly termed as good from a philosophical ethical standpoint it's how we build the basis for the idea of a psychopath or a sociopath they mm -hmm. are abnormal in their ethical choices mm -hmm. do we want psychopath cars that are making ethical decisions <laughs> that are unhuman to us all i do <laughs> <laughs> I very, very much do because I think that we can do better. And this is unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, depending upon which side of the fence you're on, um, when you present some decisions to people, they go, what, that feels very alien, and they reject it. And um, I think we see that with uh, a lot of technologies. GMO foods are, is my favorite example there where people go, oh, this is, this is terrible. And I feel the rejection of GMO foods, it doesn't hurt like your you know, hipster cafes and everything and Subiaco and everything. Uh, they go, oh, no, I only want the, non, uh, the organic ingredients which are not genetically modified. What you find it hurts is the poorest people in the world where you've had climate change that has changed where they're growing their crops. Their existing crops are no longer going to grow there but there exists a GMO equivalent, a GMO changed crop, which will grow in that, in that changed environment. And if you tell everyone, no, GMOs are bad, they're terrible, so on and so forth, the people who end up losing are the most disadvantaged and vulnerable people in the world. And um, the most sort of crying case of that is a situation called golden rice, which is um, a strain of rice with uh, vitamin A genes added, beta carotene added to it. And um, this is firmly targeting people who are too, for, too poor to afford vegetables because they have vitamin A deficiencies in their diet and so they predominantly eat rice. It's the cheapest staple that they can get. If you can have there being vitamin A in the rice, you at least solve that problem. And it's very much a, essentially an open source technology in that if you're a farmer with less than a certain income threshold, they will supply it to you for free. You can uh, replant the rice which you have. You have all of these other sorts of things. And that has been shut down again and again in terms of distribution because you have people saying, well, GMO foods are bad. And it's not hurting the people who are saying GMO foods are bad. It is hurting the poorest people in the world. So I think that we can definitely do better than human ethics. But I feel that there will be a lot of kickback from various camps about that. Isn't that... Well, 
wouldn't that shortfall in ethics just be based on a lack of information rather than... Oh, I wish it was. I really, really wish it was. Um, I don't feel it's based on a lack of, of education um, or information because I feel that people make these very gut decisions. And I think we'll see it once we see in vitro meat uh, mature, that you'll see a lot of people who go, no, I don't want to eat in vitro meat, it's unnatural. Um, even though they might say, yes, I care about animal welfare, they'll say, well, it's better that animals you know, grow up on a farm and blah, 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 and then are you know, heartlessly slaughtered for food. Um, I don't feel that's very ethical, but I feel that if you're going to have meat and it's able to be grown without an animal, that that is much, much more ethical. Um, but I don't feel that's a case of education. Um, I feel that is a, is a gut reaction. Plus, we're talking about ethics, and, and humans are notorious for uh, absolute millennia disagreeing what is good. So uh, I think we'll have problems there as well. I may also be incorrect with all of my views on ethics. I just firmly hold them. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah, so I think the one thing that's brilliant about open source is, is to avoid the government controls and the manipulations that have been going on, and the same applies to the GMO. Mm -hmm. It's mostly all manipulated, all for money. Mm -hmm. So that's where you need to get it out of that market and get it. That's why the open source can be so good. Mm -hmm. And, um, and that some of those ethical decisions are being manipulated in such a way as masses fights against Monsanto because... Mm -hmm. Monsanto is its name, mm -hmm. as we call it anyway, because, you know, it's, it's going down generations of research that, that they're ignoring, and they're same as the pharmaceutical Oh, oh I, I absolutely agree. Cartel, so I, know, I have a... You can't a, win if you don't get rid of them. I have a real problem that we are doing so much stuff for money, for profits, yes. rather than for humanitarian good. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of the stuff with autonomous uh, uh, vehicles, with uh, technological unemployment, is that it continues to concentrate wealth in the people who already have the most wealth. Yeah, yeah. If this, this is example, the Sorry, is the what? Is the gene, gene patenting. patenting? Yes, yes, is, is terrible, but it exists. And so um, I, I think that absolutely, this whole thing of concentrating wealth is something that is very, very concerning. And um, it, it defeats the whole point of capitalism as well. This, this whole thing where um, you, know, you have a capitalist society, it allows people to express their preferences using money, but people start off with wildly different amounts of money, so they end up with wildly differing abilities to express preferences. And, and absolutely it is, absolutely. And it means that the people who own a lot of capital end up making more capital. It's in the name, capitalism. <laughs> if you have capital, you win. Um, and there... Oh, who wrote the book, uh, Capital in the 21st Century? Piketty, yes, thank you. Piketty is a fascinating read on this uh, in terms of looking at this from a historical perspective and a current perspective as well. Um, um, all those good technologies you've been talking about yeah. have often been suppressed. They get bought out and then shut up. Oh, oh absolutely. And uh, you mentioned pharmaceuticals in the US, and that is almost the, like, the pinnacle of that. Um, I had a friend of mine make a comment um, looking at the disparity in prices. Um, so in Australia, we pay a lot more for movies and computer games and everything. And um, one of my friends said, couldn't we have a website where like, Americans send us cheap movies and computer games and we send them life-saving medications? <laughs> like... <laughs> <laughs> So I think, I think we might do one last question. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's, it's back on the autonomous cars and ethics again. So I, I, if someone has a different question, maybe they want to get asked that. This is but meant um, to no, I, I, I had debate. an example, uh, perhaps a concrete example of, of our inconsistency with these ethics, which I think was what you were trying to, to raise, which is just you, ha you, say, have, you have this example where someone says, okay, if I'm driving a car and a child's in the way, then you can sacrifice me. Mm -hmm. I'm, okay, I'm okay with that. But mm -hmm. if my child is driving the car, you're not allowed to do that anymore. Oh, absolutely. And so, um, the, yeah, so the, the exactly the same situation, but you're going to you're going to say no, no, sorry, that child can that child in front can get wiped out. I don't care. And and this is and, and so what 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 happens? Oh, so this is this is a beautiful example of. So we mentioned the trolley problem before. This is a beautiful example of the trolley problem, where you say you know we've got this out of control uh, trolley, this out of control train, and the classic problem is it's going to hit five people on the tracks but you can pull a lever and divert it and it hits one person. And I hope that people pull the lever. It, it, it could be a baby, it can be all sorts of things, but um, 
Um, I hope that people pull the lever. I hope that they would prefer a world where one person dies rather than five people die. But then you say, well, what happens when that single person is a baby? What happens when it's your baby? And suddenly people go, oh, I don't know now. Do I want my baby to die or five complete strangers? And um, those sorts of things are very interesting, which is, again, why I feel that having privately held autonomous vehicles may not be the best idea because then people are very invested in buying the car that will protect their family or protect their friends or so on and so forth. And there's endless variants of this as well. What happens when um, you know, the person in the car is about to cure cancer? Um, what happens when the person in the car is Hitler? Like all of these <laughs> other sorts of things, um, which, you know, uh, <laughs> what happens when the baby is Hitler? Yeah, I've seen some ridiculous variants of this and everything. And it's actually um, one of the problems I have with uh, looking at machine ethics in general is that we can't actually come to conclusions on this. And the moment that you have somebody go, oh, well, here is a, a consistent ethical framework, you find that if you take it to its logical extremes, it usually ends up being not what you want in the world. And, um, you know, you have examples of, well, you know, you should try to maximize happiness. And the machine goes, okay, great. Well, I'm going to uh, uh, take everyone and strap them into hospital beds, and then I'm just going to pump them through full, full of happy drugs. Uh, that's what you want, right? And you go, oh, actually, no, no, you shouldn't do that. You should respect people's preferences. And they say, okay, well, you know, you have humans and they go out drinking and they say, I know I'll regret this in the morning. So do you respect the humans' current preferences or their future preferences? Because they can't figure them out themselves. And what you find is that you end up with an AI that can only deliver people pictures of cats because <laughs> that's the only thing people are consistent on. So all of this stuff is really hard. And um, the discussion of how do we actually develop like broad machine ethics is really interesting because you want to say, hey, here are my ethical principles. I want you to, to take those and then figure out what the best, like the direction is that I'm heading with that and then actually like improve on them. And we have no idea how to do that. Um, it's very, very hard. Anyway, I'll be sticking around after this. So feel free to ask me interesting questions and I'll feel uncomfortable. Thank you. <laughs>